This talk will be about how to use the representations of finite abelian groups in order to prove Dirichlet's theorem on primes in arithmetic progression, which says that if you've got an arithmetic progression of the form um, um, a n plus b, there are infinitely many primes of this form. Here, here a and b are um, co-prime integers. Um, in order to show how Dirichlet's proof works, uh, I'll start by recalling Euler's proof that there are infinitely many primes. So Euler started with the Riemann zeta function, which is one over one to the s plus one over two to the s and so on. And he showed that it could be written as an infinite product over all primes of one over one minus p to the minus s. This follows easily just by writing each of these as a geometric series and expanding out. So we have one plus one over two to the s plus one over four to the s and so on times one plus one over three to the s plus one over nine to the s and so on. And the same thing for one plus one over five to the s. And if you just multiply these all together, you find the formula for zeta of s. Um, now you notice in particular that zeta of one is infinite because this is just the harmonic series. Um, now what we do is we take logarithms of both sides here. So we have log of zeta of s is sum over n um, uh, greater than or equal to one and sum over p prime. I guess I should have said p was sum over primes here of um, p to the minus n s over n. Um, so you see that this term is infinite at s equals one because it's log of infinity, which is infinite. And now you notice the terms for n greater than one have a finite sum because this sum is just sum over n greater than one and the sum over all p of p to the minus n s over n. And you can easily estimate this. This is at most sum over n greater than one and m greater than one of m to the minus n, which is equal to sum over m greater than one of one over m times m minus one, which is just equal to one. So the sum of the terms for n greater than one is finite. So the sum of the terms for n equals one, which is the sum over terms for p prime, one over p is infinite. So this is Euler's form of the theorem that there are infinitely many primes. Um, better remark that although this sum is infinite, it's only just infinite. Um, it grows very, very slowly. In fact, so slowly that if you get a computer and try adding up the reciprocals of all primes, it doesn't look as if it's tending to infinity at all. If you add up the first few billion or something, it looks as if it's tending to a limit slightly bigger than three. Um, in fact, the sum of the reciprocals of all primes for primes less than n is about log of log of n, which is pretty close to being a constant function. Um, so uh, now we um, get on to Dirichlet's theorem. Dirichlet's theorem uses Dirichlet characters, um, which are denoted by chi. Um, and a Dirichlet character is just an irreducible representation of the group of integers um, modulo n that are co-prime to n under multiplication. And instead of explaining this in detail, I'll just write out a first few examples. So let's take n equals three, for example, then z over three z, the elements co-prime to three are just one or two mod three. So we have two um, elements of this group. And there are two characters. The first character is the trivial character. And the other character 
takes values one on the identity and minus one on the element of order two. And to each Dirichlet character, I'm going to associate an L series. And the L series is going to be sum over N of chi of N over N to the S, where we put chi of N equals naught if N is not co-prime to um, capital N. So the Dirichlet series in these two cases are going to be one over one to the S, plus one over two to the S, plus one over four to the S, plus one over five to the S, plus one over seven to the S, and so on. And this will be one over one to the S, minus one over two to the S, plus one over four to the S, minus one over five to the S, plus one over seven to the S, and so on. Um, so I'll do another example. Let's just do n equals five. See what's going on this time. There are four elements in z over nz star. It can be one, two, three, or four mod five. And there are going to be four characters. And the first character is the identity character. And now this group, the element two has order four. So you can choose the value of the character at two to be any fourth root of one. So it can be um, like this. And once you've chosen this, you can fill in everything else because the character is multiplicative like this. Um, so there are four characters and we get four L series. So the first one is one over one to the S plus one over two to the S plus one over three to the S plus one over four to the S plus one over six to the S and so on. And the next one will be one over one to the S plus I over two to the S minus I over three to the S minus one over four to the S plus one over six to the S plus I over seven to the S and so on. So you can see what's going on and I, I won't bother writing up the other two because those are both fairly obvious. So these are the famous Dirichlet L series. And um, so the Dirichlet L series, Ls of chi, in general, is sum over all n of chi of n over n to the s. That's n greater than or equal to 1. Um, and just as the Riemann zeta function can be written as a product, this can be written as a product. It's a product over all primes of 1 over 1 minus chi of p times p to the minus s. And you can prove this just as you prove it for the Riemann zeta function. You just expand this out as a product of geometric series. Um, and we can take logarithms of both sides. And we find log of L of s of chi is equal to, well, now you can just expand the logarithm of this, which would be the sum of the logarithms of all these. So it would be sum over all primes and sum over n greater than or equal to 1 of chi of p to the n over n times p to the n s. That, that's just because log of 1 plus x is equal to x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 and so on. Um, so um, now we're going to use that to prove Dirichlet's theorem. Well, actually, what, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to prove Dirichlet's theorem in a special case. We'll prove that there are infinitely many primes, which are 3 mod 8. And you'll be able to see that most of this proof goes through for any other arithmetic progression. Well, what we do is we take n to be 8, and we write out the Dirichlet characters modulo 8. So we have um, four non-zero elements of z modulo 8z star, which are going to be 1, 3, 5, and 7. And there are going to be four characters, chi 1, chi 2, chi 3, and chi 4. And the first one has values like that. And this is not a cyclic group. It's a product of two groups of order 2. And we worked out the character table of, of that group. So it looks something like this. So you can see all the rows and all the columns are orthogonal as they ought to be. 
And the various Dirichlet L series look like 1 over 1 to the S plus 1 over 3 to the S plus 1 over 5 to the S plus 1 over 7 to the S and so on. And here we get 1 over 1 to the S minus 1 over 3 to the S plus 1 over 5 to the S minus 1 over 7 to the S. Here we get 1 over 1 to the S plus 1 over 3 to the S minus 1 over 5 to the S minus 1 over 7 to the S. And here we get 1 over 1 to the S minus 1 over 3 to the S minus 1 over 5 to the S plus 1 over 7 to the S and so on. And now what you notice is that this is this term here is infinite at S equals 1. However, the other three terms are finite and non-zero at S equals 1. The reason is, first of all, you can see there um, the, the, the sum is finite. For instance, this one is an alternating series, so it converges. This one is an, um, an alternating series. If you group the terms um, in pairs, you take these two minus these two and so on. And this one you have to be a little bit more careful about, but you can again see the sum is finite. And you can see the sum is non-zero because um, if you take these four terms in each of them, the sum is positive. And the next four terms, you can see the sum is positive. And the next four, the sum is positive and so on. So it's quite easy to check that these three all sum to something that's finite and non-zero. Um, now what we do is we take the function f of n, which is 1 if n is 3 mod 8 and 0 if n is is not congruent to 3 mod 8. And we write f as a linear combination of these four characters by expanding it out as a sort of Fourier series. So we know f is um, the inner product of f with xi 1 bar times chi 1 plus f chi 2 bar chi 2 plus f chi 3 bar chi 3 plus f chi 4 bar times chi 4, except I guess we should divide this all by 4, which is the order of the group G. So we see that this is chi 1 minus chi 2 plus chi 3 um, minus chi 4 all over 4. So you can see that if we take this linear combination of these four characters, we get a something that's 1 when something is 3 mod 8 and not otherwise. Um, and now we look at the corresponding logarithms of L series. So we take log of L of S chi 1 minus log L S chi 2 plus log L S chi 3 minus log L S chi 4. So these coefficients here, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, are just these four coefficients, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. Um, and we see that this is equal to sum of f p to the n over n p to the s n, which is just sum over p and n, where p to the n is congruent to 3 mod 8, 1 over n times p to the n s. And now we can prove Dirichlet's theorem because we see that this term is infinite at s equals 1, whereas these terms here are finite at s equals 1. So that implies this is infinite at s equals 1, because it's something infinite plus three finite terms. And the terms with n greater than 1 are finite um, by exactly the same argument that we used uh, for Euler's 
proof that there are infinitely many primes. So the terms with n equals 1 at s equals 1 must be infinite, which means there are infinitely many primes that are 3 modulo 8. So that's Dirichlet's very ingenious proof. Well, I said that this worked for um, arbitrary values of n, except there's one thing that doesn't work all that obviously for arbitrary values of n, which is where we said that these L series were non-zero at s equals 1. Um, we sort of checked it for n equals 8 by more or less doing an explicit calculation in each case, and you can sort of see that the sum is going to be positive. So we have this problem. Um, show Ls of chi is not equal to 0 at s equals 1. Um, so um, this is actually a sort of very special case of the Riemann hypothesis. So there's a Riemann hypothesis for these functions, which says the only zeros, apart from some trivial zeros at negative integers, have real part um, equal to a half. So you can think of this as being a tiny special case of the Riemann hypothesis. Um, in order to prove this, I'm going to quote a couple of results from complex analysis. So first of all, we're going to assume the result that L of S of chi can be extended to, an ana to a meromorphic function of S. The only pole is when S equals 1 and chi is equal to chi 1. So this is the character that is 1 everywhere. So chi 1 of n is 1 for all n except when it's 0. The second result we're going to use, that if um, fs equals sum of a n over n to the s for, for the real part of s large, and um, and if a n is greater than or equal to zero for all n, so if it has non-negative coefficients, um, if f has no singularities for s greater than or equal to, for s greater than s naught, then the series converges for um, s greater than s naught. So this is a, a sort of, actually, it's a slight generalization of the theorem that says if you've got a power series with positive coefficients, then uh, with radius of convergence rho, then it actually has a singularity at the point rho. So that's a standard theorem from complex analysis. And this is actually a mild generalization of it. Anyway, we're going to use these two theorems to show that the Dirichlet L functions don't vanish at S equals 1. And the key point here is to look at the following variation of a zeta function. I'm going to define zeta of s to be a product over all characters of L s of chi. Um, if you want to know where this comes from, it's actually something called the uh, Dedekind zeta function of a cyclotomic field. Um, I won't explain this in more detail because we don't need to use this. Anyway, what we do is we look at the logarithm of this Dedekind zeta function, and we know what the logarithms of all characters are. So it's just a sum over all chi of sum over all p and n of chi of p to the n over n times p to the n s. So that, this, this is just the logarithm of of the corresponding L series. And now we can use the orthogonality relations for these numbers chi again in order to work out what the sum over all characters is. And this is just the sum over um, all p and n with p to the n congruent to 1 modulo n of n over n times p to the n s. This is essentially because if you sum over all characters, then by the orthogonality relations, that's going to be zero unless p to the n is the identity element of the group Z modulo n.
Um, in particular, we notice that all coefficients are greater than or equal to zero. So if we exponentiate, all coefficients are greater than or equal to zero. So this is a key fact we need. We need to have positive coefficients in order to apply um, this result I mentioned earlier, which needs positive coefficients. Um, so, um, and now we notice that zeta k of naught um, does not converge. And um, you can see this because all its coefficients are integers, non-negative integers, um, when s is naught. Um, so um, it's got an infinite number of terms, so it obviously doesn't converge. So zeta k of s has a singularity somewhere. Well, all the factors have no singularities except for one of them, which has a singularity at s equals one. So the only possibility is at s equals one. Well, at s equals one, L of s chi one has a pole of order one. And this means that none of the other L functions can have a zero there because if they did, it would cancel out this pole and the Dedekind zeta function wouldn't have a singularity. So Ls of chi is non-zero for chi not equal to chi one. Um, so that gives a proof that the uh, Dirichlet L series don't vanish at S equals one. Um, incidentally, there's another proof you can give using the fact that this is the Dedekind zeta function because there's something called a class number formula which shows you can actually evaluate the residue of this function at S equals one in terms of the class number of a cyclotomic field. And the class number is non-zero, which shows that shows that this must actually have a pole at S equals one, but it's, it's, it's actually rather easier to do it like this. Um, okay, so uh, the next lecture will be um, talking a bit more about representation theory of non-abelian finite groups.